man with the carved paddle stopped. It should be somewhere here, he said. He shipped the paddle and held his arm out straight before him. The canoe was approaching the land. The bay opened out, and a gap in the white surf of the reef barked where the little river ran out to the sea. The forest came close to the beach. Far beyond, dim and almost cloud-like in texture, rose the mountains. The other man in the forepart of the canoe had a sheet of yellow paper on his knee. Come and look at this, Evans, he said. The man called Evans came swaying along the canoe until he could look over his companion's shoulder. The paper had the appearance of a rough map. On it, one could dimly make out, in almost obliterated pencil, the outline of the bay. Here, said Evans, is the reef, and here is the gap. He ran his thumbnail over the chart. This curved and twisting line is the river, and this star is the place. It's odd, said Evans after a pause, what these little marks down here are for. Chinese writing, said the man with the map. Of course, he was Chinese, said Evans. They all were, said the man with the map. They both sat for some minutes staring at the land while the canoe drifted slowly. Your turn with the paddle now, Hawker, said Evans. And his companion quietly folded up his map, put it in his pocket, passed Evans carefully, and began to paddle. Evans sat with his eyes half closed and remembered the night when he and Hooker had hit upon the Chinamen's secret. He saw the moonlit trees, the little fire burning, and the black figures of the three Chinamen, silvered on one side by moonlight and on the other glowing from the firelight, and heard them talking together in pidgin English. Hooker had caught the drift of their talk first and had motioned to him to listen. A Spanish galleon from the Philippines, hopelessly aground, and its treasure buried against the day of return lay in the background of the story. Then Chan Hai, only a year since, wandering ashore, had happened upon the gold ingots hidden for 200 years, had deserted his junk and reburied them with infinite toil, single-handed, but very safe. He laid great stress on the safety. It was a secret of his. Now he wanted help to return and exhume them. Presently, the little map fluttered and the voices sank. A fine story for two stranded British wastrels to hear. As they moved slowly across the lagoon, Evans thought of the moment when he had Chang Hai's pigtail in his hand, the cunning little face of Chang Hai, first keen and furious like a startled snake, and then fearful, treacherous, and pitiful, became overwhelmingly prominent in his mind. At the end, Chang Hai had grinned, a most incomprehensible and startling grin. They came at last to the shore and pulled the light canoe far up the beach and then went towards the edge of the jungle. At first it was toilsome going, but very speedily the trees became larger and the ground beneath them opened out. The blaze of the sunlight was replaced by insensible degrees by cool shadow. The trees became at last vast pillars that rose up to a canopy of greenery far overhead. Dim white flowers hung from their stems, and ropey creepers swung from tree to tree. The shadow deepened. Presently they saw, far ahead, a gap in the somber darkness. Then they heard the rush of water. Here is the river. We should be close to it now, said Hugo. They advanced slowly, looking curiously about them. Suddenly, Evan stopped. The devil's that, he said. He advanced suddenly with hasty steps until the body that belonged to the limp hand and arm had become visible. The thing was the figure of a Chinaman lying on his face. The two men drew closer together and stood staring silently at this ominous dead body. The neck was puffed and purple and the hands and ankles were swollen. 
It lay in a clear space among the trees. Nearby was a spade, and further off lay a scattered heap of stones close to a freshly dug hole. Someone has been here before us, said Oka, clearing his throat. Then suddenly Evans began to swear and rave and stamp on the ground. Hooker turned white but said nothing. Fart, he said, and suddenly turned away and went towards the excavation. There he gave a cry of surprise. He shouted to Evans, who was following him slowly, You fool! It's all right! It's still here! Evans hurried to the hole. Already half excavated by the ill-fated wretch beside them, lay a number of dull yellow bars. Clearing off the soil with his bare hands, Evans hastily pulled one of the heavy masses out. As he did so, a little thorn pricked his hand. He pulled the delicate spike out with his fingers and lifted the ingot. Only gold or lead could weigh like this, he said exultantly. Hooker was still looking at the dead Chinaman. He was puzzled. He stole a march on his friends, he said at last. He came here alone, and some poisonous snake has killed him. Evans took his jacket off and spread it on the ground and flung two or three ingots into it. Presently, he found that another little thorn had punctured his skin. What to do with it, Hooker? he asked. Hooker shivered again as his eye rested upon the blue figure of the Chinaman. Let's get it out of this place anyhow, he said. He took the ends of the collar of the coat in his hands and Evans took the opposite corners and they lifted the mass. It's queer, said Evans, when they had advanced only a few steps, but my arms still ache with that paddling. Curse it, he said. But the ache, I must rest. They let the coat down. Evans' face was white. Little drops of sweat stood out upon his forehead. It's stuffy somehow in this forest. What's the matter with you, said Hooker. Evans stumbled with a sudden curse. He stood for a moment staring at Hooker and then with a groan clutched at his own throat. Don't come near me, he said, and went and leant against a tree. Presently, his grip upon the trunk loosened and he slipped slowly down the stem of the tree until he was a crumpled heap at its foot. His hands were clenched convulsively. His face became distorted with pain. Hooker approached him. Don't touch me, said Evans in a stifled voice. Put the gold back on the coat. Can I do anything, said Hooker. Put the gold back on the coat. As Hooker handled the ingots, he felt a little prick on the ball of his thumb. He looked at his hand and saw a slender thorn, perhaps two inches in length. Evans gave an inarticulate cry and rolled over. Hooker stared at the thorn for a moment with dilated eyes. Then he looked at Evans, who was now cr crumpled together on the ground, his back bending and straightening spasmodically. Then he looked towards the body of the Chinaman. He thought of the little dashes in the corner of the plan. And in a moment, he understood. God help me, he said, for the thorns were similar to those the Dayaks poison and use in their blowing tubes. He understood what Chiang Hai's assurance of the safety of his treasure meant. He understood the grin now. Evans, he cried. But Evans was silent and motionless, save for a horrible spasmodic twitching of his limbs. A profound silence brooded over the forest. Then Hooker began to suck furiously at the little pink spot on the ball of his thumb, sucking for dear life. Presently, he felt a strange aching pain in his arms and shoulders, and his fingers seemed difficult to bend. Then he knew that it was too late. Abruptly, he stopped, and sitting down by the pile of ingots, and raising his chin upon his hands, he stared at the distorted but still stirring body of his companion. Cheng Hai's grin came back into his mind. The dull pain spread towards his throat and grew slowly in intensity. Far above him, a faint breeze stirred the greenery, and the white petals of some unknown flower came floating through the gloom.